I've heard there's an old Russian saying that the fox knows many things, but superficially, whereas the hedgehog knows one thing, but it really knows it well. When we study the Dharma, it's like learning to be a fox. There are four noble truths, five aggregates, five hindrances, five strengths, seven factors for awakening, eight factors in the noble path, fifteen defilements, and goes on and on and on. 108 different kinds of craving. It seems like an awful lot to know. And if you just stay with the words and the concepts, it's just lots of words and concepts. It seems has to very have to do very little with what we're doing as we meditate, because that's like being a hedgehog. You focus on the breath, and you just be with one breath. This breath right now, and get to know it really well. But the thing is that Buddha discovered all those different dharma concepts that seem so very fox-like by starting out as a hedgehog looking at his mind, see if there's still any suffering or stress in there, and focusing on learning how to observe the mind really well through mindfulness and concentration, and focusing on that one thing, and begin to see that it did divide out into lots of little things. So we keep those Dharma concepts in the background for the time when they will actually apply to what we're experiencing. And then we focus on this one thing. And as we begin to see, this one thing begins to connect up with other things. You're focusing on the breath. Is that all there is in your experience right now? Well, no, there are feelings too. Feelings of pleasure that may relate to the breath, or pains if the breath feels constricted, or pleasure with the breath, or pains in different other parts of the body. And then if you look at who's doing the looking to, at the breath, there's the perception. That's the label that helps you to stay moored with the breath. And there's the commentary that's running in the back of your mind. Is this breath good? It's not. What can we do with the next one? How is your focus? How does this feel? Lots of different comments, some of which are related to the breath, others are not. And finally, there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. Just the more passive sign of the knowing. Simply registers what's there. So you've got all these things going on here right now. And as you get to know the breath better and get to know the process of being with the breath better, you begin to see that these things do separate out and you get hands-on practice. Because you find that sometimes staying with the breath is difficult because you've got a lot of mental chatter going on. We'll see if you can take that chatter and apply it to the breath. If you're going to talk about something to yourself, we'll talk about how the breath is going. And then use your perceptions, your imagination to think about what's going on in the body right now and how the breath might possibly go to different parts of the body. Perception, you'll see, has a huge power over how things work in the body. This is actually one of the ways in which the mind communicates with itself, or different parts of the brain communicate with one another. Little images go out, and they immediately affect things many times on a subconscious level, like the subliminal messages and images that they put on very quickly on TV sometimes if they want to influence you. Well, the mind does that to itself. And if you begin to pick up on this, then you find you can put it to use. In other words, you're getting hands-on training in those five aggregates. And that's when you really get to know them. But if you find that five is too many, you can focus on any one. Perception might be one. Feeling might be another. Learn to be a connoisseur of the feelings that the breath can create. Because as the Buddha says, when he discusses feelings and establishing some mindfulness. Some feelings are just feelings, what he calls feelings of the flesh, i.e. your ordinary, everyday feelings of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain, that are associated with the senses. 
And then that feeling's not of the flesh. And what we're after here, you start out many times with pain, not of the flesh, i.e. that's the pain that where you realize you haven't gotten far in the practice or haven't gotten as far as you would like to be in the practice. There's a goal that you haven't attained. And the Buddha says that's actually a pain you want to encourage. As for pleasures and pains of the flesh, those are more individual matters. Some pleasures really have a bad impact on the mind, and others are perfectly okay. This is why we don't have the monks totally starved, living in horrible environments, in order to wean the mind off of pleasure. That was, that was the Buddha's first approach, was just to deny himself every kind of pleasure, realize that didn't work. The body needs a certain level of nourishment in order to practice the path. And as many of the texts say, you know, the beauties of nature are, can, can be really conducive to helping the mind settle in. So there are some pleasures that are okay. There are other pleasures that are going to have a bad impact on your mind. So you have to be very careful about that. This is something you want to watch. Why do these pleasures have that bad impact? And if you get to know them really well, you begin to see, well, they're associated with certain perceptions and certain mental fabrications. So even though you're focused mainly on feelings here, you find that it connects up with the other aggregates. In the beginning, you don't have to think about the other aggregates that much, just get to know your feelings. And then you begin to see, oh, it's because I have these perceptions around that pleasure that it causes problems. Or other pleasures have a really bad impact on the body. They weaken the body. Weaken your ability to think straight. You've got to learn how to wean yourself off of those pleasures. This is where the pleasure of not of the flesh comes in. You learn how to get the mind into a state of concentration where it can drink the well-being, this drink the sense of refreshment that comes when the mind can settle down and at the very least be secluded from its sensual desires. It has a chance to rest in seclusion. Or as when it gets more concentrated, okay, the concentration becomes then the basis of the pleasure. So that's the kind of feeling you want to encourage, so we can use it. So that when the temptation comes up to give in to sensual pleasures you know are unskillful, you've got something better. And the more quickly you can tap into the pleasure and not of the flesh, the more effective it's going to be in dealing with Mind's hunger to have an immediately gratif gratifying pleasure right now. Say, okay, how about this? Then you begin to notice, so the mind begins to complain, well, it's still it wanted the old pleasure. You have to ask it why, and you begin to realize, here's, here's some fabrication going on around the pleasure. There are certain perceptions that go with, I'm the kind of person who has this pleasure. I'm better than other people who don't have this pleasure. There's a lot of that out in the world. Like that old commercial for BMW, this guy comes up on a rooftop parking lot and there he sees his own BMW and he just shivers. And then they call it the BMW effect. It's not so much the feeling of the, the BMW, it's a lot of the perceptions that go around it. That it's a really classy car, and I'm a classic person because I drive that car, that kind of thing. So as you get to know feelings, you begin to realize that they're not there alone. They are connected with other things, other aggregates. But if you find that thinking about five aggregates is all too much, well, focus just on one. And you find that eventually they connect up. As you get to know this one thing, really know this one thing, like the hedgehog, you see that how all these parts and all these connections. So ultimately what you end up is with a hedge fox. You know one thing really well and you know all the aspects of it. But for the sake of the concentration, the sake of seeing things as they're actually happening, you start out with one thing. You get to know it really well. And the more reflective you are about what you're doing, 
the more you see the connections. So even though you, in the beginning you may choose one thing because it's easy to focus on, it may turn out that one of the other aggregates is really the problem. But that's not anything to worry about. Because as I said, they all connect. And when you deal with one, you inevitably have to deal with all the rest. But when you start with one, it gives you the foundation you need so you can see all of these things clearly. Because it's only when you see them directly that that knowledge of the terms will really be of use.